New Zealand agriculture is facing a raft of environmental reforms under the government's Freshwater Management National Policy Statement Amendments. These include further stock exclusions from waterways, restrictions around winter grazing, audited farm environment plans and enforcing nitrogen caps. And this is in addition to, of course, greenhouse gas mitigation policies, uh, like we were discussing earlier, and biodiversity measures um, that are yet to be announced. We're joined tonight by Nicola Dennis, Senior Analyst for Agri HQ here on Sierra's Country. Nicola, I'm really enjoying your commentary at the moment for Agri HQ. You and uh, the team with Suze and Mal, well done. Firstly, can you just tell us um, you know, what you guys are doing and bringing that fantastic commentary uh, to the wider audience? Oh, thanks, Sarah. Um, well, we, we've we always been there behind the scenes with the reports, but we've since the lockdown, I guess we've kind of uh, amped it up a little bit in terms of getting out there on the social media and pushing our message forward. So we've got um, we've got a podcast, we've got some videos that come up on the Facebook and um, general commentary there. This is Agri HQ and A. Check it out on social media and, of course, on podcasts. If you want to find all the podcasts, go to farmersweekly.co.nz, click on podcasts. There's a heap of great ones, of course, uh, where Nicola is involved as well. Now, the reason we're having a chat to you is there's a pulse segment in Farmers Weekly every week. And this week it's entitled, well, who's going to fit the bill for these environmental reforms? What inspired you to write this particular commentary? Right. Well, it's just uh, there's a rhetoric out there, I guess, that the farmers will just continue to take these costs and will be reimbursed by the export market. And I guess a lot of us were thinking already that doesn't sound particularly feasible. But I thought, oh, I'm talking to exporters every week, part of my role. I'll just ask them what what they think. Um, and once they're done piddling themselves, they came up with some really good, really good um, points around why that might not what what obstacles there might be to that uh, approach. Yeah, and I'm hearing different things on the ground as well um, in terms of premium products. Oh, you know, to for our farmers, but the struggle to seem to get that premium in a marketplace is it because that in our biggest market like China, they're not ready for this, or in our other educated markets like the US, um, nationalism of their own product takes superiority over environmental. Yeah, I guess, well, I wouldn't say that the Chinese market was uneducated because I think that where they are paying a premium for products, they are completely aware why they're paying that. I think for the most part, what they're doing is paying for food safety um, rather than provenance, or they are paying for provenance, but they're not necessarily willing to step up some extra money to pay for us to fence our waterways. That seems like an us issue, not a them issue. And then we've got in the US market where a lot of our grinding beef goes, um, that, that provenance issue that you you mentioned before is that our meat is going to balance out their fattier trimmings and the end consumer is not aware that they're eating even grass-fed beef rather than um, where it comes from. What hope do you hear back from your discussions with processors on their development plans to ensure that we move from commodity to value-add? Well, we would love to see um, the New Zealand grinding meat marketed as New Zealand, as marketed as grass-fed, but that's not for lack of trying as well. So uh, exporters were already pointing out that there's quite a lot of effort going in there because the rewards are large. And there are some companies over there that do buy our product and then market it themselves as grass-fed and hormone-free. Um, but that is, because that makes up such a large part of the carcass, for the beef carcass is that grinding beef, trimming beef. And then for the sheep carcass as well, you've got the the four quarters and things like that that go for manufacturing. It's really cracking that part because otherwise you're leaving the low yielding, high valued cuts to pick up the slack. And so that's your lamb racks, your beef tenderloins and, and things like that. And we would say that the customer is already paying quite a tidy price for that usually on a usual market. 
and you want them to add, you want them to pay more because we chose to do some things over here that increase our costs. Okay, so the title "Who Foots Their Bill for Environmental Reforms" is this simply ex, uh, market access into the future as opposed to demanding a premium for what we need to do? Yes, that's where I, as me personally, that's where I would see the largest gains to be made if we could roll a free trade agreement with the US or India or one of these large places uh, that allowed us and like, like it has done in China we we have better market access in China than most countries we're one of the first places to get a free trade agreement because we because of our reputation with food safety and we don't use the, the hormone growth promotants. I was actually thinking, you know, I've been consistently critical that the premiums aren't wide enough. I mean, you think of the Mm. margin in um, Gucci, it's 1,400% above cost. A 25 cent premium for EQ beef to silver for firm farms is not really a behavioural changer, is it? I mean, where are we going to start having a Kobe beef mentality? Yeah, and twenty five cents would be generous because I think a lot of a lot of um, of the premiums that you can get around, like maybe farm assurance, where you know you're guaranteed you do X and you're guaranteed Y, is sort of ten cents. I mean, when you're considering fencing, you know, what was it, thirty two thousand kilometers of uh, fence of waterways, those <laughs> those two things aren't comparable. <laughs> but that's not to say farmers wouldn't do that, wouldn't fence fence wouldn't fence waterways in an instance if there was some sort of fencing ferry that made it free. Because, mm. I mean, that's a win-win, isn't it? Mm-hmm. It's yeah. just the cost. A- absolutely. So in um, your day-to-day role, Nicola, uh, let's come back to, uh, you know, say the next six months forecast. There's a lot of sc- geared farm, sheep and beef farmers on the ground around what is happening with global uncertainty. Is there any, any crystal ball gla- gazing that you can bring forth um, when something like what we're discussing now it seems to be continuously so far off in a global recession? Yeah, so I guess we're looking for pockets of optimism, I suppose. Um, I would say that looking, um, we've got Chinese, the Chinese buyers pretty, buying pretty well for Chinese New Year, so that's optimistic. Uh, of course, they will stop that earlier in the new year, and then I don't know where that leaves us with the EU and the UK um, still quite affected by COVID, and the US. Who who knows where they'll be? And we've got Brexit on the on the wings as well. So we're shipping products right now into the UK. That when they get there, we don't know what the rules will be. So I don't know. <laughs> I started off optimistic, but um. By the end there, I kind of just put us into another pit of doom. Sorry. <laughs> and I think that that is why you should, of course, subscribe to AgriHQ because that is what you get. Optimism um, wrapped with realism. It's absolutely fantastic, the work that you do, Nicola, with alongside your awesome team at AgriHQ. And check out Nicola's latest Pulse article, Who Foots the Bill for Environmental Reforms, on farmersweekly.co.nz. Nicola, our theme tonight in the comments, I know that you uh, – on the land in Otago with a young family. The theme is, it's not about what we're doing now, it's about the unborn, the next generation that have no voice in the room right now. What is something that you're doing to be part of the change to our food system? Uh, I guess I try and just put my my story out there on, on my Facebook and all that so people can follow along. But uh, what I'm doing at the moment, I've got some wee chicks that I've hatched in my son's classroom. So we put the incubator in there. We've done, we've done it a couple of times now. So that everybody, whether or not they grow up on a farm or not, they can have that experience of, you know, putting a plan in motion and hoping for the best and seeing if those eggs hatch and keeping those little chicks alive. So I guess that that that's part of it. You're bringing forward a generation that understand that eggs don't just come from a supermarket. <laughs> that's yeah, awesome. And not, and not every egg hatches. Yes. So, yes. yes, absolutely. Hey, thank you so much, Nicola Dennis from Agri HQ, joining us there. Um, I'm following, as I said, her Pulse article, Who Foots the Bill for Environmental Reforms. It's a great read, and check it out. This is Sarah's Country.